Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation. Hi, I'm Colin Laveau. And I'm Angela Hagenbach. Welcome to Arts Upload. Here we are at the George Caleb Bingham Art Gallery at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Today we're going to talk about some things from the past and share plenty of stuff from the here and now as well. Everything from a chamber opera competition to an institute for puppetry, another favorite fountain and more ahead on the upload. Entanglement, love on film, almost sounds like something we can't show you on public TV. But actually we can, because it's the name of a recent opera project dreamed up by Kansas City's Black House Collective. Classical composers from all over the world competed to have their original chamber operas based on a romantic movie scene performed in front of a live audience five world premieres and a visit from a documentary filmmaker, Ross McElway, made the event a night to remember. Okay, let's get a few questions out of the way right off the bat. Starting with this one. Black House is a uh, new music organization that's uh, committed to the production of new work. And this one. Most people, when they think of opera, think long, so it's just a short form, and uh, fewer singers, fewer musicians shorter amount of time. Here's another. One of the kind of the selfish things that I take away from this kind of project is that not only do I get to make an opera, um, I get to see four other people do it. You know, I'm self-taught and they're all working on their doctorate or they're done. And so they're all way more qualified than I am. And so I'm learning from them in a big way. I'll take this one. Russ McElway directed Sherman's March, a really great 1986 first person documentary. If you don't know it, you should. But what's really important here is that one of the winning composers chose a scene from Sherman's March for his chamber opera. And that's the slightly surreal backstory for this scene, unfolding on a hot summer night downtown in the Black House rehearsal space. They called me out of the blue, and they said, sure. And then a week later, I started thinking about it, and I thought, oh, I should go film this. It's never happened before. So I called back and asked their permission to film what I'd given them permission to remake, and that's how I ended up here. There are a lot of scenes you could pick, and but they've chosen Charlene's monologue in the um, army bunker, where she castigates me for not being passionate enough. It's a very funny scene, so I'll be very curious to see how in the world they deal with this as a piece of serious experimental music and opera. Black House did tackle an opera project last year, but film wasn't part of the mix. What little money they did have, Hunter recalls, went largely toward costumes and sets. Since I'm so inexperienced with operas, I'd never written one, I'd never been a part of a pr production of any kind. I didn't realize, I forgot about the singers had to memorize the music and be able to act and all that. So the idea to use the films was an attempt to not have to buy sets. Also, it takes some of the pressure off the singers because they don't have to memorize the music. They'll be able to just read it. 
if you're going to put out an international call, you have to be sure that you have the players that can play music that doesn't have training wheels because the, uh, the composers are, you know, extremely talented and they're very cutting edge and a lot of the music is it's very, very difficult. And so I had to, you know, trust that I had players that could do that. Hunter's a reluctant entrepreneur, impresario. I tease him all the time for that because he just naturally has that inclination to bring a community of artists together and to reach out to other people. And I think that's a part of his own process as a composer. And I think he's, it's great that somebody's willing to do that because it's a lot of work. Lisa believes that when artists push the bounds of the silos they often work in, that the best results often occur. She likes to help facilitate that, even if it means simply taking tickets for the big night in Atkins Auditorium at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. For nearly two hours, the mashup of movies and music traced the arc of love and romance through a biblical epic, a frothy flight of fancy, and even a piece of early avant-garde cinema by the artist Man Ray, much to the delight of both audience and the opera's creators. They, they all came from the coast. They don't come to the Midwest and expect high-level execution. They seemed really pleased with the level of the player. That was a, a point of pride, for sure. And as for the man behind the march, color him impressed as well. I honestly did not know what I'd be finding when I came here. And if it were, you know, really amateur, like a uh, community, Theater, that would have been great. You know, I've seen those kind of productions before and they're wonderful. This was not that at all. Every one of those musicians is incredibly talented and accomplished. And, and then to see it synchronized with the clips of the different films that were used, um, the whole thing was very ambitious. I would not have predicted that someone would have chosen Sherman's March as one of the five, but that was great. I think I held my own against Richard Burton. As well as it all went, Hunter's not yet certain how year three of an opera endeavor might look. But the mission remains the same. Bring as much original music to as many receptive ears as possible. I'm not trying to make the case for chamber operas. I'm really just trying to make cool new music. Um, and the fact that it's, you know, newly made and never been heard before, that's what's important to me. If you look back at the history of most of our institutions, cultural institutions in this community, they started with the vision of one artist who had not just a vision of, uh, uh, in his art form, but had a, a passion for the community and the idea of getting this out there and making more opportunities for more people. Where am I? Well, it could be almost anywhere around the Show Me State. Join us this fall as KMOS presents Missouri Life as we spark your spirit of discovery about your hometown as we travel the state and show you all around your Missouri. That's coming up this fall right here on KMOS. Hey everyone, I'm Katie Bailey, one of the hosts for the new show on KMOS TV called Lowdown, where students produce content covering news, topics, and events happening in the University of Central Missouri and the Warrensburg community. So if you want your news on your campus, we make it happen. Be sure to tune in for Lowdown for KMOS TV, Missouri PBS. You're watching Arts Upload. Our next story takes us to a trip to Independence. For an answer to the question, what is PAI? It's the Puppetry Arts Institute, a place that preserves and promotes puppets, of course. And all because of a woman named Hazel Rollins, who at the time ran what was the world's largest puppet-making factory. Ashley Holcroft is the producer pulling the strings. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome to the Puppetry Arts Institute. It's teeming with hundreds of the most interesting puppets. From hand, to shadow, to aloof, well, not really, to a myriad of marionettes, offering workshops, exhibits, puppet shows, a library, even a gift shop. But this puppet mecca wouldn't have been possible without the unlikely career of puppet master Hazel Rollins. And as the story goes, Hazel wouldn't have gotten her start if it weren't for the lad on the left who asked her to fashion him a pal for his Italian-made marionette. That triggered the events that would eventually lead her to wild success, which included growing her company to be the largest puppet manufacturing factory in the world. She eventually ended up selling the company, the buyer ended up tanking that company, and thousands of puppet parts were in limbo until puppet devotee, Independence's own Diane Houck and her organization snatched them up to realize Rollins' dream. Hazel had written at one time that she wanted a puppet museum because she was also a collector. And she didn't get any support from what she called the city fathers. So I said, if we're gonna do this, let's try to do her dream. Let's earn the money and try to have a place that honors her and honors puppetry. So after pounding the pavement for seven years, they finally raised the $10,000 needed. And in 2001, they made Hazel's dream a reality. We found this place. I grew up in Inglewood. My dad started the Inglewood five and 10. I was an Inglewood kid, so I walked in this place. I'd looked, oh, we'd looked at so many other places. And I said, this is perfect. We labored over our name for a long time. We wanted to put puppetry first. We wanted arts because we wanted to be known as an art form. And then the last word, we didn't want to be a center. Uh, you know, what were we? And one of our members said, we are an educational institute because we want to educate people. I said, perfect. And that commitment to education is ingrained in everything that PAI does. Like this summer's exhibit, shining the light on female puppeteers from the 1920s through 50s. I started doing research on because I didn't know about all of these ladies. These were sisters, Marie and Mildred Gordon. Uh -huh that were from Chicago, and we don't have a lot of information about them. They asked the place where they were going to the hospital if they had a platform, so they didn't have to take that. And they said, oh yeah, we have something. Well, they got there and they didn't have anything, and they put them on two wicker chairs. Oh no. And they were trying to work these marionettes, <laughs> and the whole curtain came down, and they said they got lots of laughs. <laughs> the, uh, Soldiers thought it was really funny. They said, oh, you were better, better than Eddie Tanner when he came to see us. <laughs> but before we go too much further, there's one last thing I didn't tell you. While Hazel was building her worldwide puppet empire, Diane was doing some globetrotting of her own. Well, I lived in England for three years during the 60s. I lived in Taiwan, Malaysia, and Indonesia, and Thailand, and Iraq, and Egypt, and. Nigeria, and it was a wonderful time. And when I went to London, I'd never been in a big city, and I want kids in the Midwest to have a world view. I think it's really important. And puppets are such a good way to do it because it's something they're interested in. So she brought back dozens of puppets plucked from various corners of the world and united them here in the PAI International Room. We don't do a formal tour with kids about, well, this puppet came from so-and-so, and this puppet came from so-and-so. But what I do is I listen to the kids when they're looking. And if they're asking a question like, where's that? I have a good map, and I take them over and I say, this is where Thailand is. Oh, and this is where you live. And oh, you know. But with kids, you need to have them ask the question because then they're interested in the answer. Now, you may be thinking, really, kids and antique puppets? It's only a matter of time before one of them loses an arm or an antler or a fan. Or we don't have things or... under glass. We know that the children would like to touch things, but this is part of our mission 
is we have signs that say thank you for not touching and this is how we teach children how to come into a place like this and respect the objects that we have on view. Occasionally we get more adults touching things than we do kids. But this isn't a place of just hands off. Hands on is highly encouraged at the make your own authentic Hazel Puppet Workshop. And they paint it the way they want it. And I say, if you want a girl with blue hair or you want a green monkey, great. It's your imagination. Have fun with it. And after the paint dries, the kids hit the big stage to learn how to use their new friend. What is your favorite food? You know, the usual stuff, spaghetti, macaroni and cheese, grandma's. You eat grandma's? <laughs> no, now. I'm kidding. Well, that's about it for PAI. But what about those thousands of puppet parts? Well, they're kept on the lowest level of a storage facility located deep within the Earth's crust, where they wait. No, seriously, they, along with hundreds of off-duty puppets that look like they're serving some pretty hard time, are all in a storage area in the Independence Caves. But enough of that. Let's buoy back to the surface and let Giovanni and Maria give some words of advice. Hi, this is Maria, and come see the puppets that are here. Come schedule a visit. You'll like it so much that you'll want to come until you're 50. <laughs> or a hundred. I'm thinking a hundred. And now on to another edition of My Favorite Fountains. Let's take a look at another fountain spectacular. We are at the Neptune Fountain here at the Country Club Plaza. I like the Neptune Fountain because it is beautiful and it has a great backstory. Neptune was originally made in 1911 in England for a estate in Pennsylvania. They sold him to an art dealer, and I don't know how he ended up on a scrap heap. It was actually saved by J.C. Nichols. He put out an edict to all of the workers and all of the people who were involved in building the plaza and said, we need statues, we need fountains, we need public art. Go find it. They found him on top of a train car of scrap metal. And they said, Jason Nichols, you gotta come get him. And he came over and he found him and he paid the price of scrap metal. Brought it back, put him on the plaza, and he's j just gorgeous. I think part of the reason people enjoy it is because it's right here at eye level. The Jason Nichols Fountain is huge and monstrous, and there's lots of violence happening in it, and this one, He's just coming out of the sea with some horses and some fish and, you know, he's got his trident, but that's his signature, so it's okay. My father was drafted into Vietnam at the height of the conflict. He became a single parent of two young children. We moved a lot. We slept in rest areas. We slept in our car. I didn't realize that we were actually homeless. It makes your world really small. If we happened to stay in a motel that happened to have a TV, it was really special. We loved Nova, especially when it would be about space. We would talk for hours about the universe. Watching Nova, I felt big. Like, my mind was big, my ideas were big. The trajectory of my life changed. I could see a world outside of our poverty, and I felt like things were gonna get better. PBS opened up a world I didn't know existed. Hey, next week on the show, we'll take a look at two creative couples, including one that has a clothing line of their own. Up next, we'll sit down with a painter who likes to take his art outside, no matter what the weather. Niall Gordon is not your average painter. 
Forget the small, stuffy studio. Niall prefers a challenge. I started painting outside about, oh, about four, three or four years ago. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it's really improved my painting. Um, you can see the color so much better. It's really the best way to, to learn how to, how to see and how to you know, mix color and just to be outside. You know, if you paint for photographs, a lot of the color is lost in the translation. You know, and if you paint from a you know, monitor or something, there's a lot of colors can't, can't uh, show up. Your eyes are just so much better than a camera. It's technically called plein air. Paint outside, it's a French term. It's kind of a, a big thing right now. There's a lot of plein air competitions around the country that I participate in. It basically, it's just a street scene with uh, a little blue bug is the kind of the focal point. I kind of ran it off the page a little bit. I didn't really want to make it a portrait of the bug, but it, it was it's definitely the most interesting thing in the in the in the picture. But um, the rain and the the colors reflecting off the street and you know things like that. Um, try not to get too caught up in detail and just look at the the design and the shapes and you know how the painting works as a whole um, which is really hard to do <laughs> just being out in the elements you know you, you never know what's going to happen um, it, it really sometimes you know what I like to call happy accidents happen um, you know I, I was painting last winter and you know the snow got into my paint and it, it actually crystallized in the paint and it was just a really strange consistency, and then I brought it inside, and and, um, and it, it started melting, and so, and then when it was dry, it actually had little holes where the water had come out of the paint, but it, it had this strange kind of texture that stayed in the painting. There's just something about being outside; you're responding to the the elements and the color, and um, it's just very different than painting in your studio in a controlled environment. Uh, sometimes it, it rushes you and you have to um, just do the best you can in the time frame you have. Well, just in case you thought battling the elements should be enough of a challenge, Niall has yet another one up his sleeve. You know, probably my favorite thing, uh, most exciting thing, one of the most challenging things is doing uh, very quick portraits of people. On your mark, oh, yeah, like that. get set, uh, yeah. go. It's, it's very stimulating intellectually. You've got a lot of things going on. When you're painting, there's so many things happening. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think so, but there's just so many things you're thinking about. You know, you're thinking about design and color and the consistency of the paint. And when you're, when you're designing a picture, you know, one brush stroke can kind of affect the whole uh, composition, you're, you know, or, you know, you change a color here and it makes another color look a certain way and so you're constantly adjusting and, you know, you have the texture to deal with and, you know, just all those variables, you know, push you and, you know, cause you to be a better painter, you know, than you would otherwise. Hello everyone, my name is Josh Leonard, host of a new show called Upstart Film, where I sit down with independent filmmakers, actors, and everyone in the indep independent industry from Kansas City to Columbia and even to Warrensburg as I talk to them about their hardships and processes when it comes to making independent film. You definitely don't want to miss this new exciting show, Upstart Film, for your Thursday, only on KMOS TV. Wow, <laughs> we've done it again. We've worked our way through another show of sculptures, fountains, opera, and even puppets. And you know what? Next week we'll mix it all up and try it again with more great art and stories for you. As we wrap things up, let's let the talented guys from making movies get us in motion. And it's with the music from the 909 session on the bridge. I'm Colin Laveau. And I'm Angela Hagenbach. We'll catch you next time on Arts Upload. 
Y eres lo que quiero en este mundo, lo que yo extraño Pero eres lo que quiero en este mundo, lo que más daño Me hiciste daño Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation.